found men's ministries. You know, this is my hometown here. An Episcopalian. My has changed. Whoo! If you have your word with you tonight, I want to share with you a couple of scriptures. Turn to, oh, if I can, First Peter. I want to be very brief because I want to get Randy up here to preach tonight. A message that's burning in his heart and my heart. But you see, the word, God has put a word in my heart about this day, this hour. See, I haven't always been in ministry. Those of you that don't know me or know my background, I spent the last 23 years in the United States Secret Service. Now, you might ask, why would God bring a Secret Service agent in to lead a ministry as radical as this? He knows. I've always said he has a sense of humor. But I want to tell you right now, see, the key is not, a what, not whether or not I'm able to lead it. He'll make me able. It's whether or not I'm available. That's the only able that makes a difference. And I see around this nation, around this world, men being called out of their chosen profession, of their chosen profession. And God's saying, lay it down and follow me. You see, it's going to take more than the ministers that we have right now. It's going to take each and every one of us to go out and reap that last day's harvest. You see, I used to serve presidents, but now I serve a king. I used to clothe myself in the full armor of God, but now I, clothe, I used to clothe myself in body armor. I messed that one up, didn't I? I still clothe myself in the full armor of God. Yeah. Well, see, I used to wear a bulletproof vest. How many of you get so busy in your work that you forget to put on your full armor every morning? How many of you get so busy in your commute that you're thinking about what you're going to do at work instead of praying for your brother? See, I used to carry a gun, too, but now I carry the sword. It says in 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 7, it says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And if you turn over to 2 Peter, it says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth will and everything in it will be laid bare. In verse 12 it says, as you look forward, you ought to look, you ought to live a holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Further down in 13 it says, looking forward to a new heaven, a new earth, the home of righteousness, and to make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. And be on guard that you not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. And finally, over in Romans 12, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer yourself as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Father, right now, Lord God, I claim every man that hears this message that they would be transformed into being godly men, first following you in everything they do. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, 
being in the Secret Service is not without some training. And as I went through 23 years of my career in the Secret Service, I found that I spent most of my time training. You see, because Secret Service agents train themselves to react contrary to human nature. And in order to do that, you've got to purify yourself. You've got to get yourself to react according to what is innate in you, and that is through training. If you remember the Reagan shooting, and Tim McCarthy came out of that hotel and was walking out there and shots started being fired, as they started ringing off, Tim McCarthy turned and made himself large. He didn't crouch down and get away, which is the natural tendency for men to self-preserve or protect their own life. He reacted according to what was in him. You see, as men, I'm challenging men all over this country. Put the gospel in you, not garbage. Be able to re react according to what God has in you. You see, Jesus came to this earth and he spent 30 years training, three years in ministry. But he made himself large for us. He knew he was going to die, yet he humbled himself even unto death on a cross for you and for me. What can we do as men? What can we, you, me, do as men? We can offer ourselves as living sacrifices, training ourselves to be godly men, following our Father's example in using the Word of God to give us the direction that we need in our lives instead of the world. You see, as God is pouring out His Spirit during this, what I believe is the last days, Honorbound has risen up out of the ashes. You see, Honorbound is not what men do, it's who we are. We're honor bound to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're honor bound to our families. We're honor bound to those in authority over us, such as our pastors. We're honor bound men. You see, Promise Keepers puts on a great stadium event. And we've been blessed by the Promise Keepers events. But when I was sitting in that stadium and before I moved out in the ministry, I was going, now what? What do I do now? And what Honorbound is providing is that now what? We're about discipling men for Christ, growing a godly army, making godly men. And see, this conference, this first national conference, let me tell you something. Eight years ago, in 1990, I was in a church in Maryland, and I was praying for land that we were trying to occupy and build a church building upon. So I went out and I started doing a Jericho drive around this 40 acres. I started praying and interceding the Lord you would provide a way to provide this to uh, our body. And as I was driving in this Maryland roads, the two-lane highways of Germantown and Gaithersburg, I got overcome with the Holy Spirit, so much so that I had to pull off the road lest I be hit head-on by some oncoming traffic and not see it, tears coming out of my eyes. And as I began praying, I opened my eyes and I looked around me, and as far as the eye could see, pastors, as far as the eye could see, all the way around me, were rolling hills of corn. Immediately, God gave me a scripture of 1 Timothy 2.8. I want men everywhere with holy hands raised in anger without in dispute. Holy hands raised in prayer without anger and dispute. I want men with holy hands raised in prayer without anger and dispute. You see, right then, that cornfield transformed itself to legions of men with holy hands raised, those ears of corn shooting up straight into the sky, pointing toward heaven, praising God. I saw, as far as the eye could see, legions of men representing their families. Immediately, God started talking to my heart, said, I want you to gather men, teach them, train them, and raise up an army of God. 
And I said, Father, I'm just a Secret Service agent. How am I going to do that? Well, see, I went through the next seven years. That was a focus in my life. I was working in men's ministries and trying to obtain and reach the goal, that the vision that God had given me until I went to a little gathering in Washington, D.C. on October the 4th, 1997. And I stood on that mall. And I looked back as far as the eye could see. I saw men with holy hands raised in prayer, asking forgiveness. I saw men transformed into that vision. And I started to weep because, you see, I didn't want that vision to end on a mall at a Promise Keepers rally. I knew that the only way it could end is the hand of God would come down and rapture us all. You see, I didn't want that vision to end. It was too, it drove me daily. And as I hit my knees and started praying, Lord, Lord, God just kind of gave me a hug like he does sometimes. And he said, this isn't the end. This is the beginning. You see, it wasn't six months later when Brother Trask asked me to lead Honor Bound Men's Ministries. I believe that God is raising up Honor Bound beyond the assemblies of God, beyond everything else, reaching men for Christ, reaching men for Christ. You see, if you were given this tonight, was everybody given this? Raise your hand if you got one of these tonight. It was passed out, the Reach 3 cards. No? You're going to get them while you're here. I'm going to talk about the Reach 3 during this conference. But what, I, but what, is, what is going on with Honor Bound is we're going to pray for other men. We're going to reach other men for Christ. See, I'm going to challenge you this week to start praying for three other unsaved men in your life. Because we have to take our nation. We have to start praying, getting on our knees and praying that it would come back. Is it intimidating standing behind this pulpit? You bet it is. I want to tell you right now, I'm just a Secret Service agent serving God. But I love God with all my heart. And I'm going to follow Him no matter what. Why did I choose Brownsville? It's because Brother Kilpatrick said, yes, come. Come. I want to see men disciple. I see all kind of men come to the Lord in the last four years during this revival. But we need to disciple them. I also feel that by launching a prayer and evangelism outreach from Honor Bound with our prayer and Reach 3 commitment that what better place to start where a revival has been going on for four years. And also because it's my home. It's my hometown. I don't live here. I live in Springfield, Missouri. But I want to tell you right now, I feel like I'm part of it. Deep down inside. You see, there are men dying and going to hell. There are young men dying and going to hell. I'm going to be sharing with you during this whole conference. I'm not going to take up a lot of time because I want to move on to, to Brother Randy. But see, there's a burden on my heart. And I shared that with Brother Randy Rez a few months back. And I said, listen, I see young men leaving youth all fired up for God. And then they move on and go off to college or get a job or start looking for a spouse or get married or building their career. And they go back in the church and they don't feel like they belong. Younger men. And you go up to them and you say, well, what about men's ministries? Don't you get involved in men's ministries? They say, well, that's the old man's club. You see, I want to raise a generation of honor-bound extreme young men. It'll take that passion. I don't mean extreme in radicalism. I mean extreme in their relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to reach young men. We're gonna, you know, we were in the prayer room before coming out tonight. Men back there praying right now. And let me tell you, ladies are praying right across the street right now. Friday night, there was an all-night, midnight to 6 a.m. prayer meeting in the chapel here for this conference. The groundwork has been laid. The prayer foundation has been laid to bless each and every one of you because Jesus wants to do a work in your life. 
we were back in the prayer room and Brother Ruiz asked all the men under 30 to step into the center of the circle. And about 20, 20 to 30 young men stepped in there and he prayed for his generation. And as I was standing there, I could see the older men of my generation standing around. And I prayed for my generation to continue blessing the younger generation, to mentor the younger generation. You see, we can't let our brothers, we can't let our brothers think they're alone. We have to work with them. You see, I want to raise up a young generation as well as mentoring and helping the older generation. I want older men to be able to mentor younger men. We want to be able to replace the lack of the fathers in the home with men that we've turned around, we've changed our households where there's not a divorce, it's just an easy answer. It's unacceptable. But I know God brought me to honor bound, to ministry for a time such as now. 23 years in the Secret Service. Gave me discipline. Gave me experiences of in human terms, in secular terms, I'll never forget. But you know, they seem like a dim image right now because all I see is the glory of God before me. I see the challenge of reaching men across this nation. Men that have walked away from their responsibilities in their homes. And I'm gonna challenge you to start praying for those men in your lives. You see, each one of you each one of us know three men that do not know Christ. Start praying about that tonight. We're going to talk more about it in the morning. Brother Randy, I want you to come and bless us with your word. Randy is an evangelist traveling. He lives in Springfield. Has a tremendous anointing on his ministry. Give him a welcome. Hallelujah. Now clap your hands for Jesus. Well, you didn't hear me. I said clap your hands for Jesus. No, no. I didn't say the President of the United States. I didn't say a man. I said the Master, the Savior, the Lion of Judah, the Blessed Prince of Peace, and the hope of glory. Somebody clap your hands for Jesus. Well, don't stop. He's the only one worthy of your praise. Now listen to me. We've been shouting all night. But we've been shouting as individuals. And I want you in just a couple of moments to shout as an army. Some of you that are dignified are going to set that aside and shout for the cause of Christ. Tell the person next to you, say, God's going to bless your socks off. <laughs> now, how many not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, listen, America loves scary movies. They love roller coasters. And there are church experts that say if you take the scary part out of church, people will come. When it's just the opposite. When you put the scary part back into church, they come. You see, I represent a generation that loves it when the blinded eye see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the dumb begin to talk again. What we are tired of and finished with is a monotone homily of words that has no power, relevance, or fire from God. We are sick and tired of splashing around in some religious mud puddle and calling it Holy Ghost rain. We are ready for the last day's outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. So the world goes to screaming concerts 
and tells a lie well while the church tells the truth poorly. Charles Finney said, theaters are full and churches are empty because the church tells the truth poorly and the world tells a lie well. Now, I believe there's one more shout in you. I've studied the shout. It's called the Shabbat. And I've studied great revivals that when the people of God shout to God with a voice of triumph, demons leave the facility. And people are saved in record numbers. The reason is the protection that keeps them from Christ is taken away. The layer and the membrane that spares them conviction is removed by the shout of God. Not the shout of emotional freaks, but the shout of the children of God. Because the Bible says, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Now, many are asking, why in the world are you asking us to shout one more time? I believe the Lord is going to give you hundreds of souls when you go back home. But you need to know that the majority of those souls will not be won by eloquence from the pulpit or some sort of intellectual argument that is set forth. But they are going to be won by the power and the presence and the awesomeness of God. Now listen to me. It's not up to us to create an atmosphere where the intellectual or the politically correct feel at home at your church. But it is a place that you must go and make the Holy Spirit feel at home. And when the writer of Psalms speaks of the voice of triumph, he was thinking of a soldier. We just thank the Lord for the great veterans that have fought for our nation. I thank God for them. Listen to me. I'm sick and tired of hearing Charles Barkley, an American hero. Michael Jordan, an American hero. They're not American heroes. Shame on us. You want to see an American hero? Go to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, where the oil still comes up from the bottom where young men and women gave their life for the cause of Christ so a 34-year-old Pentecostal preacher can preach there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That, my friends, is an American hero. Well, when a soldier is in battle, they feel at any minute they might die. And they don't think they'll see their wife or their children again, and death knocks on their heart's door every day. Then as the sun begins to set, the warrior begins to discover that their vicious, foul enemy has been turned aside, and they've broken through the enemy lines. And suddenly there rises out of the soldier a cry that cannot be duplicated by the shallow or the superficial or the secure person. But only the child of God and the worry that realizes, I'm not going to die, but I'm going to live. I am going to see my wife again. I'm not going to die in some unmarked grave, but I shall be the warrior that God has called me to be. So listen, America, and I want you to hear me. There is not a group in the nation that has a right right now to raise their voice like the men that are locked in this building. The therapists can't help this nation. The police and political system have failed us. Only the power and the presence of God can rescue America now. And those of us that are saved, those of us that have been redeemed, those of us that have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, we have a shout in us that says, Devil, you can't have my family. You can't have my children. You can't have my pastor. So I want every Army of God member to shout right now with a voice of triumph, for God has given us the city! Shout to God! a triumph. Woo! You that have been set free, you that have been delivered, shout to God with a voice of triumph. 
Now, just before you're seated, grab your Bible and lift it over your head. And I want you to repeat after me, in my hand, in my hand is, raw power, is raw power given to me by God. Me by God. I shall hide the word in my heart that I will not sin against him. Now clap your hands one more time for Jesus and give him the praise he deserves. <laughs> praise him, church. Praise him. You may be seated. I want you to turn to the book of the Revelation, the second chapter. I have a prophetic word for you. There is a difference between the prophetic word and the rhema word. If I said that there is sin in Pensacola, that's not a prophetic word. <laughs> but if I said there's sin in the building, it's sitting five rows back and three seats in on the left-hand side, now that's a prophetic word. And don't go counting the poor guy sitting back there. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor, I didn't... <laughs> <laughs> Revelation, the second chapter, starting in the first verse. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deed, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. The actual text is, I have something against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen and repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now today, more than any other time in the historicity of our planet, people are growing hungry for the anointing. The anointing can be translated the personality of the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, sanctified, born again, and Christ came to live in your life, he brought into your life the Holy Spirit who brought with him his personality. You could read about the fruits of that personality in Galatians. There's also gifts of that personality. And people are growing hungry for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand right off there's a difference between the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit upon you. That he is in you to prepare you as a bride, adorned for the bridegroom. He comes upon you for ministry. How do I know he's upon me, Pastor? I believe that the physical evidence of him being upon you or the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And today, more than any other time in history, people are growing hungry for that type of anointing. We want a radical way in the way we raise our children. We no longer can have the normal approach to parenting, gentlemen. You now need a black belt in parenting. <laughs> or as I tell my three sons, any other kind of belt I can get my hand on. <laughs> Black, brown, yellow, or green, it matters not. The days that now I lay me down to sleep are gone, never again to return to the home of the Pentecostal father. Nowadays, when your children go to sleep, you must lay your hands on them and boldly proclaim, Devil, you keep your filthy, twisted, luger hands off my sons and daughters in the name of Jesus the Christ. You must plead the word. You must confess your faith. You must never give up in the name of Jesus. And in the middle of this mess that we call modern day America, families try to raise their children, pay their bills, and keep their emotions under control. So the modern day Pentecostal church can no longer be a sermonette, three songs, and let's go home. Did you hear what I said? See, I believe that every church meeting must be an all out attack upon the kingdoms of darkness. Well, you didn't hear me. I said, I believe that every church meeting must be an all-out attack upon the kingdoms of darkness. Amen? And what we used to call a holy meeting, what we used to call an awesome night, what the old-timers used to classify as a revival. See, they used to say we sat under the glory spot where the anointing came out. 
That must be a mandatory part of church life every single time you get together. You've got to come hungry and broken for the things of God. We must get something from God every single time the doors of the church are open. You've got to have more joy than the devil has fear. You have to have more Holy Ghost raw power than the destructive nature of modern day America. I've grown up in this thing called Pentecost. I'll be 34 years old, June 23rd, for all the cards and letters that might come, bless God. And they used to teach us the only way you get the anointing was to come to an old-fashioned mourner's bench, weep and wail and tarry and wait on the Holy Spirit. Grabbing a hold of the horns of that altar and looking into the eyes of a Galilean master and boldly proclaiming, Holy Spirit, I'm not here for the programs. I'm not here for the preacher. I'm here because I need you. I'm here because I can't live without you. That's the reason why I'm here. We all came to the altar, the deacons, the elders, the herding, the ushers, the choir members. But in today's Pentecostal church, we have relegated the altar to the sick, the sinner, and the herding. We sit back and roll our theological eyes and say, well, I'm not sick and I haven't sinned that bad and I'm not hurting, so I guess I don't have to go to the altar of God. Yes, you come when you're sick. Yes, you come when you're hurting. Yes, you come for repentance. But the main reason, sir, you come to the altar is we are hungry as one body and one bride to touch the helm of the garment of Jesus Christ. The reason you come is this is the age of the supernatural and the preternatural. The preternatural, Webster's Dictionary defines, is where we get our word from psychokinetics or psychotherapy. It's a pre substitute for the power of God or a demonic synthetic for the supernatural. You will either experience a demonic synthetic of the demonic powers of hell or you'll experience a move of the powers of God. But in this, the age of the supernatural and the preternatural, you shall experience something from somewhere. Are you in the building? So you must come to the altar to grab a hold of the horns and tell the Holy Spirit, I can't love my wife unless I touch you. I can't raise my children unless I hear from you. I can't serve my pastor unless I get a touch from God and the Holy Spirit blows over my mind and my body because you mean that you really don't know who you are till the Holy Ghost breathes on you. Because really all you are is a ceramic. All you are is a bunch of dirt. Turn to the guy next to you and say, I like you, brother, but you're really just a bunch of dirt. <laughs> you see, the scripture says that the father called God bent down and grabbed a piece of dirt and he pulled out the thorns and he pulled out the bugs and he pulled out the worms and the ticks and the slugs and the ants and he began to form man. He created you, but he also formed you. He formed you in his image. And then he breathed over you and he created your spirit. See, God never forms something that he's not going to fill. Mm, mm, mm. He formed the earth and he filled it with visitation. He formed the tabernacle and he filled it with his glory. He formed man and filled it with his spirit. Hallelujah. We used to teach the only way to get the anointing was to get in an altar and have him breathe on you. And out of those altars came the fire of God and the anointing and the fire from Pentecost fell to heal the sick, to raise those that were afflicted. We didn't have to lay hands on too many people because the Holy Ghost was doing it already. We've abused the gifts of God. In my generation nowadays, anything that's max of emotionalism, we don't want it. We've lost the power of Pentecost. And there's a special flame that comes out of a candlestick or a lampstand. And I want to speak to you about that for a moment. For when I read Revelation, the second chapter, it brought to mind all the awesome, powerful things I have seen as a child growing up in Pentecost. There was a church in Los Angeles, California, that was a virtual powerhouse of anointing. It was called Angelus Temple. It reached movie stars and professional athletes by the thousands. They had 12,000 members. 
And there wasn't a nation in the world whose spiritual leader at one time or another had not gone to that church. But they would have Holy Spirit meetings with the likes of Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Roberts. And my grandmother and my family that we grew up in Southern California, we would drive down the freeway just to sit in the glory of God or the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God put in the middle of that church a lampstand or a candlestick like what is mentioned in the book of the Revelation. Now, please let me explain myself so no one misses this. Remember, these seven churches were actual congregations, Ephesus and Smyrna, Laodicea and so on. Yet the Apostle John hears God's voice speaking not only to the New Testament churches of Asia, but to the church universal, indeed to every single believer who was looking for Christ's soon return. The Lamb stands a privileged position before God, where Jesus walks among you. A church is not great because of its building or its money or its talent or its visibility. This is not a great church because of Pastor Kilpatrick, though he is a wonderful anointed man, and we love him. It is not a wonderful church because of Brother Stephen Hill. It's not a wonderful church because of their school of ministry. The churches that I have preached around the country and held meetings in are not wonderful churches because of their programs, their visibility, their CDs, annuities, or bank accounts. That's not what makes you a great church. What makes you a great church is that Christ himself is in the building every single time you meet together. He's hovering over the babies in the nursery. He's moving through the choir law. He's manifest through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. And Jesus brings the greatness. He brings the goosebumps. He brings the chill bumps. You don't have to stir anything up. How many know when the Holy Ghost moves in? You don't have to worry about the emotion. He'll bring it with him. Amen. Amen. The Bible says Jesus walked among the seven lampstands of these churches that were privileged to be given this gift. And here is what a lampstand does. It immediately makes a church visible to an entire region. And the light that goes out says the glory of God resides here. Not manipulation, domination, or intimidation. Those are the works of the flesh. Those are Jezebel. I believe God has the authority and the power to take me out if he wants and lay me out on the floor. But he does not need my help. Don't push me. Don't you dare push me. And you better hear me, men. If the Holy Spirit lays you out, he does it for one reason and one reason alone, to chuck you in the socket of your hip and change your name, give you a new countenance, give you a new ministry, and give you a fresh call of God. If you come up off the floor and you're not changed, it was not God, it was the flesh. I'm tired of the flesh, tired of weak-willed, vacillating, milk-toast Christians. Want the move of God. That church in Los Angeles, they got saved in record numbers. Thousands would be radically transformed and baptized in water. And for years, the glory cloud of God hovered over the building. The saints who birthed the power through prayer began to pass on to their great reward. And God began to warn that church not to abandon what made them great. He warned about pride, secret sin, arrogance, and losing their first love. He sent prophets and teachers and friends, but the church leadership would not have anything to do with the warnings. They were basking in their past momentum. Mm. And the Lord removed the lampstand. And it's an ugly feeling to own a huge auditorium, a mass facility that once housed 12,000 members to now have 400. A place that was once filled with the fire and the passion of God now are filled with cobwebs of a bygone move of Pentecost. Now in Revelation, Jesus begins his judgments by listing the many good things that bless him, but he also sees several things that grieve him deeply. His first message was to the Christians at Ephesus, a church founded on the gospel teaching of the Apostle Paul. 
Revelation 2 and 4, thou hast left thy first love, he said. When Jesus is speaking of the word first love, he isn't speaking of the immature love that you received when you first got saved. Rather, he's speaking of exclusive love. Exclusive love. Hosea! Yes, Lord. Hosea, you have saved yourself for a chaste virgin. Yes, Lord, I've saved myself for a virtuous woman. Hosea, I love you and I want to honor you, so Hosea, I've got a wife for you. Praise God. Where is she, Lord? Hosea, she's on the corner of 5th and 9th. I want you to go to the red light district. Excuse me, God. I want you to go to the red light district for your wife to be is the one standing on the corner waving at all the men as they go by. I want you to marry a prostitute, a hooker, a common thief, a common tramp. Lord. But Lord, I, I don't understand. Hosea, when you struggle to love someone that really doesn't love you, when you have to struggle to hold someone that's looking past you and trying to hold somebody else, when you have to go to the slave table and redeem her back, someone which was rightfully yours to begin with, Hosea, and you shouldn't have to redeem her back, but now you must redeem her back. Hosea, when you redeem her back and you struggle to love her, then you will begin to understand how difficult it is for me to try to love you. Exclusive love. Hosea says, yes, Lord. Abraham, I want you to take thine only son and go to the region called Moriah and sacrifice him there on an altar of wood. But Lord, he's not only my only son, he's the hope of Israel in his loins is the future of all the nations I want to know Abraham when your back is up against the wall will you still love me exclusive love gentlemen it is significant in Revelation 2 that of all the sins Jesus points out in the seven churches, adultery, covetousness, lukewarmness, false teaching, Jezebel's inauthority, and dead worship, the first sin he mentions is the one that grieves him the most. The loss of affection from his sons. Now these Christians at Ephesus had walked closely with the Lord. As you read through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, you are amazed at the gospel these people heard and the gospel they lived. Paul compliments them at length and he addresses them in Ephesians 1 and 19. He says, the faithful in Christ Jesus, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places with Christ. Chosen before the foundation of the world, forgiven people having the revelation, the mystery of Christ and being sealed with the Holy Spirit and promise. What an awesome description of a blessed holy people. Yet Jesus points out something else in the hearts of the Ephesians, something that hurts him deeply. He says, I see all your works, your hatred for sin, your love for truth, and your righteous courage. And yet somehow, in all your labors, you have allowed your first love to wither, and your affection for me is dying. If this is not a prophetic word for the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic church, there is not a prophetic word. When I read of Jesus walking among such well-thought believers and taught believers as the Ephesians and telling them, I have something against you, it grips my heart. And I have to ask them, Lord, do you have something against me? Do you have something against my generation? 
I believe the warning to the Ephesians is intended for me personally as well as every Christian living that's looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus is saying, and don't you dare miss this, I believe he was telling the Ephesians, it is not enough for you to be a caring, giving, diligent servant who grieves over sin and preaches truth. It's not enough for you to uphold moral standards enduring suffering for my name's sake or even be burned at the stake for your faith. For all these things are a part of taking up my cross. You can do all these things in my name, but if the, in the process of doing them, your affection for me does not increase. If I'm not becoming more and more the delight of your heart, then you have lost your first love. If you claim to have the fire of God, yell and scream and dance about, yet I am no longer the delight of your heart, I will take every bit of light you have. No matter what good works you do for me, I believe he is telling us tonight, you will no longer be my witnesses. I simply won't recognize anything you do because you have lost your first love for me. You'd better hear me, church. Judas Iscariot, who became the betrayer. Interesting that it says he became the betrayer. Because it dawned on me that you can only become a betrayer unless you have been someone who has been trusted. Someone who has been loved. Jesus in the garden looks at Judas and he says, is this how you will betray the Son of Man with a kiss or a show of affection? I wonder how many men sitting in this building every Sunday morning betray Christ with a show of affection. Raising our hands on Sunday morning, affectionate. Know him not on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I heard you shouting and I saw you jumping. And the thought crossed my mind, led by the Holy Spirit, how many of them know me? Revelation 2 and 5, remember the height from which you have fallen and repent. And do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, what I'm about to tell you, gentlemen, is very difficult. For I am a minister with the Assemblies of God, and I know there are other movements here. But I also am an American. And I believe that not only are churches given a lampstand, but so are nations. And God in every century has had a nation. And I believe he has said, you, so long as you are faithful, obedient, and righteous, I will put a lampstand and you will be the seed of Christianity to all the world. It all started the moment the apostle Paul was born again. His life was summed up in the city of Rome because Rome was going to be the first lampstand or candlestick or seed of Christianity to the world. The book of Romans opens the heart greater than anything the apostle wrote. But then the lampstand was moved to London, England. At one time in history, the British sent powerful missionaries around the world. There was a supreme Christian nation of the entire planet. Their Bible colleges and university bulged with mighty prophetic preaching and teaching. They were sent all over the world to India, to Africa, to Asia Minor. And just as they had been imperialistic and conquering nations, they went out and preached the gospel of Jesus the Christ to the four corners of this planet. But listen very closely, because it gets very prophetic right now. At the close of every century, something strange begins to happen to the lampstand nations of the world. For gentlemen, history tells us that the last decade of every century has repeatedly run the same course. 1790 to 1800, or 1890 to 1900. 
from the 1990s to the year 2000 has been the peak of immorality in the world and especially in that lampstand nation. Biblical historians have isolated five telltale signs and warnings that the lampstand is possibly about to be removed and sent someplace else. After studying London, England, studying Rome and present-day America, Dr. David McKenna has listed five signs that God is about to take his hand off of this nation. Number one. The system of justice and criminal law breaks down. The legal system collapses under the weight of all the criminal cases they must try. Does that not sound like America? Number two, politicians become absolutely indistinguishable from each other. The people feel there is no longer a clear choice, so they no longer cast the vote. In the last presidential election, baby boomers, baby busters, and Generation Xers were all asked by CNBC, ABC, CBS, why was it you did not cast your vote? With one voice, they all replied, we no longer felt there was a clear choice, so we no longer casted a vote. Number three, the wealth is inordinately transferred to an elite group. The wealth is inordinately transferred to an elite group. Number four, immorality becomes pandemic. And five, the church becomes lethargic and inward, losing its influence in the mainstream culture of their part of the world. And you say, preacher, I was with you till you got to number five. I don't believe we're losing our influence in the mainstream of the culture of this world. I beg to differ, my friend. When they can hand a condom to your daughter or your son with a diploma they did not earn, we're losing our influence in the mainstream of the American culture. When your daughter can have an abortion on the high school level and you as her father will not even be notified because the government of the United States has seen to it that the protection of the child and the relationship between the parent and the child is not as important as the relationship between the teacher and the child then we're losing our influence in the mainstream of the American culture. When they can take the Ten Commandments off the local high schools because it may lend a moral influence to society, then we're losing our influence in the mainstream of the American culture. When Walt Disney Corporation can be looked at by the Assemblies of God and the Southern Baptist Convention and told we will ban you unless you stop propagating the homosexual agenda and Walt Disney does not even flinch, then we are losing our influence in the mainstream of the American culture. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, we didn't have to have metal detectors at the door. We had Jesus. And here's the point, gentlemen. 200 years ago this decade, England relinquished the lampstand as the seat of Christianity, and it moved west to the United States of America. In America, we became a great nation. Not because of our money, not because of our talent, not because of our ingenuity, or our self-determination, but because we as a nation took the gift of the lampstand called the power of the Holy Spirit. And we said, Lord, we shall be the supreme missionary nation to the world. We will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will put it on every airwave. We will preach the gospel to every known tongue. And God bless this nation. The lampstand was moved by God from Italy to England and now present-day America. But America, you hear this young preacher. We have eclipsed by the grace of God all that England has ever achieved. For their great John Wesley, the Lord gave us Charles Finney. For their Charles Spurgeon, the Lord gave us Dr. D.L. Moody. The societies began to explode. The Southern Baptist Church showed the world the first systematic way and approach to gospelizing every nation under the sun. And they made a commitment in 1907 not to give up on the evangelist. And 40 years later to the day, God gave them Dr. Billy Graham. You cannot talk about a lampstand without talking about Azusa, California. Talk about a lampstand where God used a poor black preacher, a one-eyed black preacher who could not get into many white churches. And the power of the cross came there. His people would say, Pastor, 
You're embarrassing us. Blinded eyes are opening. The deaf are hearing. The lame are walking. And we look to find you and your head is buried in an old wooden shoebox. And William Seymour would stand up and he'd wipe his brow and he'd smile at his people and he'd say, Beloved, in a true move of God, man seeks first to look for the mighty man of God. But he soon finds out that in a true move of God, there's no such thing as a mighty man of God, only a man of a mighty God. It's come full circle. Sitting in this building, there's not one single mighty man of God, but there's thousands of men of a mighty God that are ready to take this nation back and see the hand of God move across the planet. Well, if you believe it, clap your hands for it. Hallelujah. Now, what God has done in America is astonishing and it's overwhelming. But we are doing what England and Italy have already done. And I must say something right here, and you need to pay very close attention. And I pray that I won't be misunderstood. Many Christians cast your vote for president. And whether or not you pick parole, Dole, or Clinton, the question must be asked, how does the media interpret the outcome? You need to hear me say, I pray for our president daily. I pray for his wife and I pray for his daughter. For God tells me to pray for those that are in authority over me. Does that mean I agree with every? No, it doesn't. But it means I pray for them. I pray that God would reveal himself to him. You see, my God was God during Reagan years. My God was God during Bush years. My God will be God during the Clinton years and into a new millennium. My God still is God. It matters not who's in the White House. It matters only who's in the heavenly house. Amen. But the question must be asked, how does the media interpret the outcome? How did the gay movement interpret that selection? How did the forces that are pro-abortion interpret the outcome? Now, if you're born again and you voted for Bill Clinton, don't you dare for a moment even suspect that I am saying you condone immorality. That would be wrong. That would be a judgment. That would be foolish. It is quite possible that many out of a sincere conscience felt they were making the right choice, and I can't judge that. My God is in control. But what I am saying is we'd be less than a vegetable if we did not acknowledge how his re-election was interpreted by the groups I just mentioned. His re-election said to them, let's expand and enlarge our efforts because America is ready for a bisexual moral standard. And the American father, the Pentecostal father, sat home on the couch. We've done nothing to bring it to it doesn't happen. His election said America is ready for a bisexual moral standard. America is ready for expanded abortion even in the final trimester of pregnancy. 43% of U.S. women will have an abortion in their lifetime. Abortion is as common occurrence, a life experience, as divorce. Three times more common than breast cancer. People cry out all the time in our crusades, Lord, can't you send us another Charles Finney? Can't you send us another Reese Howell? And God always answers, I have America, and you have aborted them. <laughs> Dr. James Dobson said if we were to erect the wall to the aborted child as we have to the fallen Vietnam veteran in Washington, D.C., the wall would be 50 feet high and 50 miles long and expanding every day. And with the signal that's gone out, we can expect more violence, more crime, and more filth. Fathers, I want you to hear me. You've only begun to see the bloodbath in America's junior highs and high schools unless we turn back again to God, unless you become the priest of your home. It's amazing how everyone at Columbine High School can cry out to God, the day of a tragedy, but the day before that, I couldn't even get a Bible in that school. And the media quoted thousands of people who said their vote was against what they perceived to be the Christian coalition. It was their rejection of these active Christians who were trying to change our nation, they said. They said, we weren't voting for a man, we were voting against a Christian coalition. 
Those Americans have said we want more immorality. We want less of the Christian influence. We want abortion on demand. And my friend, that will bring the judgment of God on America. Now we must look at London, England, and what happened in the late 18th century just before they lost the lampstand of God. There were more people going to seances than were going to the Church of England. You see, the devil has seen to it that you gentlemen do not have to go to a seance. You can sit in the comfort of your home and dial 1-800-PSYCHIC and a demon can come right across the phone line as you begin to look for your future. In the city of London, there were 60,000 prostitutes operating. The devil has won up that in America. You don't have to go see a prostitute now. Many of you go lock yourself in the basement and you get on the internet. You say, well, preacher, I'm not having a physical affair. My friend, your wife cannot live up to that person on that screen. No one can live up to a fantasy. And to the fair of your mind, Jesus said, as a man thinketh, so be it. Fifteen hundred evangelical pastors across this nation of the land of the free and the home of the brave will fall to pornography on the internet by the time 19 and 99 comes to an end. Many of the men within the sound of my voice, you're locked in pornography, but tonight you get deliverance. Tonight you get set free. The church was abandoned, morals were gone. I want every pastor to hear me. Sir, for, even for a moment, don't you guess that if you had a little poster out at the Christian bookstore saying you're going to have a program, don't you even think for a moment the sinners are not coming. Haven't you noticed we'll put up all kinds of posters and flyers all over town saying we're having a Christmas pageant, but there's no sinners in the building. And Bessie comes from down the street. All our friends come from the other churches and no one's getting saved. There's no conscience in America anymore. The reason the sinner's not coming to your church, Pastor, is because they don't think they're sinners. We've lost the moral compass. When the President of the United States can point his finger at America and say, I did not have sex with that woman, and 65% of the American population says, I believe him because the economy's good. It scares a young preacher. Remember, David was repentant for sinning with Bathsheba when Nathan pointed his finger in his ashen face and said, Thou art the man. But when David repented, his child was still born dead. His daughter was raped. His son Absalom was hung from a tree, and he cried out, Absalom, Absalom, my heart crieth after thee, Absalom. The sword never left David's house. I am deeply concerned for a nation when 65% of the American people and many even in our churches see there's nothing wrong with what's happening in our government. In London, England, the church was abandoned, morals were gone. Meanwhile, men like Whitfield and Wesley were preaching in America and the lampstand moved west. There's been a revival going on in this building for the last four years. Reports are, and I haven't talked to the staff here, but the last reports I heard, in the last 18 months, 100,000 people have been born again in these altars. 100,000. Someone the other day said, Brother Randy, I don't believe those statistics. I said, okay, how about 50,000? How about 25,000? How about 50? I'll take 15,000. How about you? I'll take 10. I'll take five. I'll take one. When's the last time someone was born again in your church? When's the last time someone was healed? Oh, but we know how to jump, Pastor. We know how to pro. Oh, we can have church, Pastor. 
Doesn't matter how high you jump, just matters how straight you walk when you get back down, amen? Turn to the person next to you, say, he's talking about you. I know he's not talking about me. <laughs> Reports were that in order to get into this church, you had to arrive at 6.30 a.m. for a 7.30 p.m. service. Over 50% of the audiences in the last four years have been pastors from around the world. Out of the 2,000 seats in this building, that means 1,000 of them might have been pastors. At four meetings a week, that means there's a potential for a Holy Ghost baptism of fire to fall on 4,000 pastors every seven days. And for those of you who are not privileged to the information, Dr. Cho prophesied that a revival would come to America. And pointing at a map of America, God told him that the revival would start in Pensacola, Florida. Remember, he passes a church of 10,000 people. And he said, the fire will be so great, it will envelop all of America. Don't you dare miss what I'm about to say. Glue your eyes right here. I don't care where revival starts. I don't care if it starts here in Pensacola or if it starts in Coca-Cola. I just want revival to start, and I won't get prideful. I won't get jealous, and I won't get arrogant. Lord, if you can send it to Pensacola, send it to America. We're ready. We want it. We need it. We've got to have it. If you want the lampstand, somebody shout to God and say, I want it. Bring us the fire, Lord. We want the latter rain. The gentleman, our government has told God to get lost. Truth is relative. There are no boundaries. Situational ethics are reigning now in the White House. They have said we don't want a godly influence in our families and with apologies to Hillary Clinton, it doesn't take the village to raise your children. It takes a mom and a dad and the Holy Ghost. Now, how many know that's the real moral majority? Amen. Yeah. Somebody said, Brother Randy, you're not too politically correct. <laughs> I said, why be politically correct when I can be right? Somebody said, well, you've got to have a little more temperance. You've got to just be a little more nice, Pastor. I said, okay, I'll take my lead from Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah heard that some of the Israelite men were allowing their sons and daughters to marry idol-worshiping morons. So it says that Nehemiah went over there, grabbed the men by the hair, dragged them on the floor, slapped them around, knocked them down, caused them to have a commitment to Christ. At times I feel like a young Nehemiah. If it means I have to grab somebody, if it means I have to knock somebody by the subside of the head to let them know God is real, I'm willing to do it. You see, I want you to like me, but I need not have it. It's enough for me if I go back to the hotel room tonight, lay my head on that pillow, wrung out from the anointing of God. If somewhere in the deep recesses in the corners of my heart, I hear the master say, well done, thou faithful servant. Well done. I love you. I want you to like me, but I need not have it. I refuse to compromise this Bible for an end-time generation that's about to take the Holy Spirit across the plate. Somebody told me, they said, Brother Randy, the pulpit's not a place to preach those kind of things. <laughs> I said, listen, I got a responsibility to a young generation. I got a responsibility to them. For John Wesley said, if I don't preach the gospel at the very point the devil is attacking in this juncture in history, I have not brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've got a responsibility to tell your children. I've got a responsibility to tell your youth pastors. It's okay to be young, it's okay to be cool, but it's also okay to be a Bible thumping pew, jumping Jesus, loving, devil shoving, blood by child of the Almighty God. America says we want a free meal. We've come out to state where we stand. Meanwhile, a church of 10,000 people in Korea are praying that God would lift them to the seat of Christianity in this world. And they don't pray for five minutes, gentlemen. They pray for hour after hour. When's the last time you turned off the television and laid in your home as the priest and just moaned before God? 
For Pensacola is not an accident. Michigan is not an accident. Where Pastor Benson has been seeing a revival, an outpouring of God. But we are at the end of the century. We are where Rome and England were just before the God calls them to lose the lampstand. And America, you listen to me because I want to see God passionately stay in our nation. Church of 1,000 in Korea are praying for God to raise them to the seat of Christian power. Singapore is exploding under a cadre of multi-billionaires who have given themselves to the cause of Christ and people are getting saved in record numbers in Seoul, Korea. Singapore. Asia is beginning to show all the life and all the signs and all the energy and all the passion and spiritual hunger that America had 200 years ago when we received the lampstand from London, England. And now the year 2000 is coming up and there's a great deliberation going on in heaven. I believe God the Father is walking back and forth on the ethereal throne and he's asking, do they really want it? Shall a nation that once under God honored human life but is now trying to legalize gay marriage and Hawaii and San Francisco have already done it. God's asking, do you really want it? Now we have mainline denominations who are ordaining homosexuals to the ministry. Do we really want it? We now have legalized abortion. God is asking America, how bad do you want it? And through our actions, the church is telling God, we don't know if we want it either. Through our actions, we're saying, you're something we endure. You see, the Ephesians had something we have lost. Revelation 2 and 6, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans says, simply having faith allows man to do as he pleases. Jesus was saying, you hate all doctrines, church of Ephesus, of easy believism that says God overlooks the deeds of the flesh. You're faithfully stand up against unholy lifestyles and you cling to righteousness. Glue your eyes right here. Oh, that that would be again a part of the character of the modern day Pentecostal charismatic church. For easy believism reigns supreme in many homes that call themselves the children of God. We literally have men who would think it's no big deal to go spend $7.95 to sit for three hours in a movie theater to watch a movie about a ship you know is going to sink. Eat 10 pounds of popcorn, 42 gallons of lemonade, be busting, got to go to the restroom, but you don't want to get up because you might miss something. You're afraid you might offend the person behind you or the people around you. Meanwhile, church goes a little, ooh, low glory. Church goes a little overtime and suddenly everybody's hitting the door at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You invest $7.95 into the theater but can't invest $7.95 and two hours into the kingdom of God. Easy believism. Then I had men tell me it was the best movie I ever saw, preacher. I've never seen it. But I have had them tell me that there was a scene with a woman's naked breast on there. Was that your wife? If it wasn't your wife, you had no business looking at that woman. You see, if you can look at a woman and not have your spirit grieved, if you can watch simulated acts of sex on the screen and not have your spirit grieved, if you can sit in a movie theater for three and a half hours and not give God 15 minutes a day and not have your spirit grieved, then my friend, you're backslid. You're backslid. See, backslidden is, if at any other time in your Christian walk, you were closer to God than you are right now. If at any other time in your Christian walk, you were closer to God than you are right now, then my friend, you're backslidden. Easy believism is the power of God, pastor, falls on Sunday morning, but daddy lays on the couch Sunday night watching football, wondering, do we really want to go back and sit in the glory of God? Easy 
easy believism says we don't have to go to church tonight. It's Wednesday night. We got to have family time. Well, let's talk about family time. Daddy's laying on the couch. Mom is in the kitchen making lunches. Kids are outside playing Nintendo or running around. Meanwhile, the glory of God's falling. Discipleship is moving. The pillar of fire by day and the glory cloud by night. Folks are getting baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, you're sitting back wondering why I can't have a revival. Easy believism. Easy believism is God, I'll tithe, but pastor, God expects me to pay my bills. So after I get set up a little bit, after I get the business going, after I get the children a little grown up more, after I get them through college, then I'll begin to tithe, Lord. Then I'll give you more time, Lord. Pastor, you can count on me, but I've got to do something else first. I've got to set up my business. I've got to set things up. Rebellion is the root of this type of attitude. For there is no consuming fire to please only God. And no matter what some slick-haired, shiny-shoed person told you on TV, there's no such thing as the permissive will of God and the perfect will of God. It's either the perfect will of God or you're in sin, my brother. It's either black or white, wheat or tear, sheep or goats. You're either a cowardly compromiser in the dirt, trying to be proclaimed as politically correct, or you're the child of God like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing on the plains of Dura with a ramrod of the Holy Spirit of God, looking at the 90-foot statues of America and saying, as for me and my house, we shall not bow. Because God wants to know, do you really want it? Because Asia is praying for it. And it could move again. The year 2000 will not only be the transference of a century, but, but, but a millennium. Is that the date, gentlemen, that we will watch Japan, China, Asia, Singapore, and Korea become the seat of Christian faith? Is that the day you will watch your children lose the anointing of God? Look at England. England has never returned to the world prominence she enjoyed since she lost the lampstand. She has not seen the prosperity she once had. She's been bombed out twice. And I know for a fact that America is not being protected by its money or its intellectuals. Do you think it's an accident that we are enjoying the greatest economy in the history of the world? Do you think it's an accident that your children have never seen a world war on the shores of this great nation? I feel like Nehemiah, Brother Jeff. Because Nehemiah fought and fought and fought to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, then found out in the 13th chapter that his greatest enemy was not on the outside, but the inside. And I have found out many times before I could fight the devil, I got to fight the church. Are you in the building? See, we used to argue over color of carpeting. That used to split the church. Whether we sang from an organ or a hymnal, that used to split the church. Now we fight over a move of God. And God's asking, do you really want it? And everything in my soul says it's time to pray. Not to survive, not just to stay saved, not to enjoy the blessings, but to pray for fire. Holy Spirit fire. For gentlemen, I don't want to lose the anointing. Pentecostal Assemblies of God, I don't want to lose the anointing. We started out with the anointing, we must finish strong. And there's sin in the building. I need a piano player very, very quickly. It's time to pray and ask God to, Lord, don't take your hands off my children. We'll still send out missionaries from our churches and preach with fire. Not singing psychologists who have been sold out and been commercialized but are filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
The question you must ask yourself right now, my friend, is how bad do you want the lampstand? Glue your eyes right here. Yes, God set a lampstand in this church. But if God could set it here, he could set it in your church. The question is, are you willing to pay the price to bring back glory? Are you willing to clean up your act and repent before God? Because America is now becoming a mission field for Korea and Australia. In this last move of God, I believe before Christ comes, it's meant to make a statement. And here it is. America, this is your last chance to recapture your first love. You reject this and I'm moving the lampstand. Because I will not take the billions on earth who need the gospel and have them wait while you debate theories and get over your trauma. Pentecostal movement, charismatic movement, evangelical churches, it's time to repent. To remember the height from which we have fallen and do the things we did at first. If you do not repent, God will come to us and remove the lampstand from its place. This generation of modern day Pentecostals, we need to fall in love with God all over again. Remember when you first met God, gentlemen, you couldn't wait to spend time with him. Today by our actions, we're telling him we're something we endure. God forgive us for intimidating our pastors for shutting down at a certain time to fit into our time schedule. God forgive us for telling God you've got one hour on Sunday morning and I'm not coming back on Sunday night. And you can forget Wednesday night, preacher. But you've got one hour, God, to get all your healing, all your deliverance, all your manifestations. One hour to heal the sick. And if you don't do it in one hour, we're gone. And we're losing a generation. I want every father to listen to me. We're losing our children. So, sir, what kind of church do you want when you get back home? I stood in the altars of Bloomington Assembly of God in Bloomington, Minnesota. Pastor Jerry Strangquist and I were praying for the people as 2,000 people were weeping in the altars. And my three-year-old son made his way through the crowd and he said, Daddy, come here. Daddy, come here. I said, son, sh I... And he stood there and waited. Daddy, come here. I walked over and I picked him up and I said, what, son, what's... Tears welled up in his little eyes and he said, Daddy, there's something in the building that I don't understand. He said, I smell something. I didn't know what it was. Here I was conducting a revival of 2,000 people and the priest of my home and I didn't know what it was and I said baby I he said come here dad and I picked him up and we sat down and he said do you smell it and the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear and he said son tell him that's me I said baby that's Jesus you smell He's setting a lampstand down here. And he looked at me with his big eyes and he said, Daddy, I want more of Jesus. Can I get more of Jesus? Sir, when you go home, you shall be the lampstand of God to your children. When's the last time your son said, Daddy, come here? I want more of Jesus. 
Pastor, when's the last time the fragrance of the Holy Spirit filled your building? Do you know what I'm praying for? That the power of God would go home with you and that you would know presence evangelism. That when you walk into the building of your church or stand in your pulpit, the presence of God would come. And you wouldn't have to utter a single word. And your sons and daughters would say, Daddy, I want more of Jesus. I'm praying for our general council in August. By an upraised hand, how many would say, Brother Randy, I want more of Jesus. Now lift the other hand and just begin to tell him, I want more of Jesus. There are men in this building that have to repent. Do you want the lamb stand, America? Do you want it? Then you're going to have to fight for it in an altar. There are men in this building that must repent. You're hooked on pornography on the internet. Your relationship with God is not right. And you're running the risk of losing the lampstand to your children. You're running the risk of losing the lampstand in your church. And God cannot rest in a dirty church. Backslidden preachers and backslidden deacons, backslidden ushers and backslidden choir members, they will not bring the lampstand of God to their church. It's time to repent. Cry out to God. Every single man in the building that says, Brother Randy, I've got to repent. I'm not right. I've got to get this thing right with God, and I need the lampstand. I want you to come right now to this altar. I want you to run to Jesus. Don't you wait. Don't you just run to Jesus right now. You run with everything in you. You run to Jesus. You run to Jesus. I've got to repent. I want the lampstand. Don't you dare pray quietly in this altar. You cry out to God right now. Now the rest of us, you lift your hands and say, Lord, we want the lampstand. We want the anointing. We want the power of God. Lord, if you can send it to Pensacola, then you can send it to Ann Arbor, Michigan. You can send it to Springfield, Missouri. You can send it to Kansas City. You cry the name of your city out and say, Lord, send it back with me. Send it back with me to my church. Send it back with me to my parents. Send it back to my home. I want it. I need it. I've got to have it right now. Cry out. Spare not. Sing something, brother. Come on, pastoral staff, come help me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, guys, come help me. Come on, come on, come on. Come help me. In Jesus' name. Come on, Chad. Come on, guys. In Jesus' name. Father, purify them right now. In Jesus' name. May the purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Every pornographic spirit, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Every demonic horde, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Mighty God. Cry out, church. Cry out, church. Repent. Repent. Right now. Ask him for the lampstand. You're going to have to cry out for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Burning a 
us, Lord. Father, bring us to a place of repentance. We need men of extreme authority. Repent. You foul spirit, I come against you in the name of Jesus. Deliver him right now in Jesus' name. Deliver him in Jesus' name. Man, I need you to pray right now. Mighty God. Lord, don't take your hands off his children. Lord, don't take your hands off of his children. In Jesus' name. Lord, we repent. We repent, Lord. Don't take your hands off of our sons and daughters. Don't take your hands off of America. Father, we want you to stay in our nation. We want you, Lord. We want you in our churches. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Right now, right now, there's some sitting right there in the pew. God's saying, I don't want a 98% Christian. I want a 100% sold out man of God. And you're holding back 2% that only you know about. That only you know about. And God's saying to you right now, right now, get out of that pew and get down here. If there's not room, make room. If there's aisles out there, get on your knees before God. You see, we're cleaning the house tonight. We're cleaning the house tonight so we can start building on a foundation. If that's you right now, when they start singing again, you need to get out of that pew. You see, you sit there thinking, well, it's been a long service. Well, it has, but I want to tell you right now, God is worth it. God is worth it. Right now, right now. Come on, church, turn to the guy next to you and ask him. Turn to the guy next to you. Do you need to be down there? Do you need to be down there? Come with him. Bring him down here. Yes, Ron. Yes. Come on, church, respond. Right now. That's it. Come on, brother. Come on, friend. Don't anybody move from the altar. Don't anybody move from the altar. You see, now's the time to get right with God. We have altar workers that Brownsville has, trained altar workers, coming and pray with you tonight. But I want to tell you, man, what you're doing right now, you're breaking, you're breaking through that, that brassed over clouds in the heavenlies. You're getting through to God. God's seeing you tonight. He's seeing you with a pure heart. You're relieving 
your sin right here at the altar, being washed over by the blood, being washed over by the blood. You see, we got to start taking a firm, solid foundation so that we can grow in Christ as the men that he's called us to be. And with every head, every man looking this way toward the altar, toward God, toward Jesus, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, purify me. Wash me clean. Make me more like you. God, use me in a deeper way. Touch me, Lord. Remove the sin from me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for me, for standing large for me. Forgive me, Lord, for the things that I've done against you. Take this week, Lord, of my life and build in me a new man, a man rooted in the Word of God, a, a man with the Holy Spirit guiding him. Touch me, Lord. Fill me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got altar workers that are going to move amongst you right now.